of the contenders in the Big Ten, who stands the best chance to win the conference this year? And will the Big Ten get more than one team in the college football playoff, or will a dark horse emerge? Well, the ultimate college football preview on Locked On Big Ten is here and is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, I want to welcome some colleagues of mine from the Locked On Network. Of course, from Locked On uh, Nittany Lions, we've got Zach Seiko here, and from Locked On Wolverines, Isaiah Hole. I want to get into it, and obviously, a lot of talk going on. In the entire month of August, the Big Ten has dominated the airwaves. We haven't even played a game yet. Of course, expansion is the talk. And I want to start with you, Zach, because, you know, we're going to get rid of divisions in the conference this year. Now we're adding all these teams, and I'm thinking they might bring them back. What do you think? Get your thoughts on the whole expansion thing. Some people are for it. Some are against it. Where do you stand? I'm for it just because it makes college football that much more exciting. You get – Penn State versus Oregon, like that's what people look forward to. Penn State versus Washington, the cachet of Penn State, Indiana, Penn State, Purdue. I'm sorry, just doesn't doesn't have it. I, if I'm to keep it real simple, though, from a Penn State perspective and and anybody else, adding more schools does it shrink the piece of the pie for Michigan, for Penn State, for others around the Big Ten? All these schools were getting 100 million dollars from the Fox, CBS, NBC contract, so. When Washington, Oregon, and who else, whoever else they're going to add, when they come in, are is Penn State and Michigan's just because I, I want to pay respect to Isaiah. You know, are are they going to lose a smaller? Are they going to lose a portion of that share? So I, I'm all you know. I'm here to champion Penn State athletics as a whole, and anything that cuts into that 100 million, honestly, doesn't sit right by me. Isaiah, you had one of your regents at Michigan, very outspoken about it this week. What do you think about it? I, I'm a little back and forth on the 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 greatness and of the thing that uh, Zach mentioned of having the having the bigger matchups because I always am for bigger matchups right I, I I would take that over the 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 kind of non-conference slate that Michigan has had last year and this year uh, any day but I also it, it it is kind of bizarre to me especially especially for the non-revenue sports I mean you're gonna have these midweek, uh, games where it's volleyball and you've got, uh, you know, whether it's Michigan traveling to USC, you're going to have Rutgers people traveling to Oregon, vice versa. And, and to me, the, the, it creates a lot of extra travel. And that's one of the things that Regent Jordan Acker brought up is, is getting to Eugene is actually a more difficult task on a public charter than it is getting to London. And I, to me, to me, those types of logistics do cause kind of a problem. I mean, even, even just in season football, if you have two West Coast trips, I mean, I know that Hawaii is kind of used to doing it, uh, but uh, getting away from the regionality, I mean, especially when you're adding all of these schools, I feel like eventually it's going to go right back to regionality. It's just going to have one or two big conferences, and then there's going to be these divisions in which it's regional. Uh, I say get there as fast as you, you actually can, uh, just so that you can kind of uh, not displace the student-athlete's livelihood that much. And certainly for the non-revenue sports, because it's just it doesn't make any sense having uh, non-revenue sports having to travel all the way across the country throughout the year. I thought it was very telling that the Big Ten just stopped at two more schools with uh, Washington and, of course, Oregon. And they, they didn't add Cal. They didn't add Stanford. I thought there was a possibility about a week out before it eventually happened. And I think they're leaving room for two more to see maybe the best of the rest to see what happens with the ACC. Notre Dame is always a question. But I'll ask you guys, how big do you think the conference goes? I think it stops at 20. I think they've got room for two more maybe from the ACC. Maybe you guys think it goes bigger. Zach, we'll start with you. Yeah, there was no chance. I'll, I'll address Cal and Stanford first. There was no chance that the Big Ten would ever add schools like a Cal and a Stanford because they don't care about – sport if football primarily cal right there's the rumor that they wanted to drop down to uh, an fcs program when it came to to football i think they'll eventually expand to even 24 i think the big 10 is looking to go towards that bigger footprint and ultimately you are going to get the big 10 whatever it's going to be 
the SEC, which can keep its name, and then a merger of the Big 12, the Ace, whatever's left of the ACC, and whatever's left of this Pac-4, Pac-2, what, whatever we're calling it in the present in early August 2023 here. I think you're going to get three mega conferences that are going to merge into something that eventually is able to break away from the NCAA and form its own national college football league eventually something that is a minor league to the nfl a little more on brand for it which is already what college football is but i i like what i I like where it's headed from the star powered these these schools believe they can survive on their own and and they can and that's what's going to happen a big league merged with these three mega conferences before we get into the upcoming season isaiah how about you how big did we go here in the big 10 Well, 24 is the number I'm looking at. I'm going to have to disagree, though, with Zach about them not adding uh, Cal or Stanford, uh, that being something they would never do. Look at what the Big Ten did a couple of uh, years ago. I mean, it's almost a decade now, but uh, Rutgers and Maryland, not exactly football powerhouses. It's all about the media markets, and we saw that with those two adding Washington, D.C. and adding New York City uh, to get Cal and Stanford one or the other, uh, or both that would – uh, you, you'd be adding two premium academic institutions, which generally has been the Big Ten's uh, ethos. And then you're adding the San Francisco market to that, as well as Oakland. That's a pretty big media market. So I do think that they're going to continue to uh, to look at some of those other schools that kind of have the best of both worlds. Notre Dame, obviously, although it seems like Notre Dame is still going to continue to hold out as long as it can. I wouldn't be surprised if you see... Uh, Georgia Tech, just strictly because it is a big media market in Atlanta. They do have AAU accreditation. Uh, Florida State, Miami. Uh, I don't know that Tallahassee brings a lot. Miami certainly doesn't from a fan base standpoint or even a crowd standpoint, but it does by bringing in uh, a really big media market there. Uh, So I I think that the Big Ten is going to continue to have that, that ethos. They brought in Rutgers, Maryland, and USC and UCLA pretty much strictly for being able to get into those bigger media markets. As we look ahead to this season, I'm glad you guys are on in this opening segment. And actually, our colleague Jay Stevens from Locked On Buckeyes, which you all can catch to our audience out there at any time, just couldn't make it for this today. I guess, even though I was born in Detroit, Michigan, I'll represent the Buckeyes here. Uh, who's going to win this conference? Isaiah, every, everybody I see says it's a Michigan, Ohio State, or Ohio State, Michigan. It's flip flop. But, uh, and Zach, we'll get to you because I have some interesting thoughts about Penn State. But Isaiah, uh, Michigan, is it, is this is Michigan's, uh, the conference title to, to lose at this point? I think it absolutely can be. I mean, obviously the, the big most important thing for any team in college football is staying healthy. The last time Michigan was voted by the Cleveland the media members, in the cleveland.com poll was 2019 and Michigan's quarterback, Shea Patterson got hurt on the very first play kind of changed the dynamics of that season. Uh, and not to mention Ohio state, of course had uh, Justin Fields coming in. So uh, it, it, you kind of never know uh, what's going to actually happen. That's why they play the games. I do think Michigan is poised to be the best team in the conference. They return the bulk of their players. I believe the eighth most production returning in all of college football, certainly number one in the Big Ten. You've got a quarterback in J.J. McCarthy, who uh, I think is a lot better than people give him credit for just because Michigan kind of put him in a box uh, and didn't really feel like they needed to utilize him that much considering they have Blake Corum and Donovan Edwards. Those two return as well. You've got uh, the, the, not quite the same offensive line, but you add three really key pieces by the transfer portal, and th- they, you have a defense that is returning the bulk of its players. I mean, there are some guys who are gone, uh, but it's kind of one of those addition by subtraction type of situations. Michigan is certainly in a spot where it could and it should. Uh, the non-conference slate is pretty simple. It's not really much different than the last year, but I, I guess the question is, is, does Michigan stay healthy, and do they take every – team on the schedule seriously because honestly i mean you look at uh, the last three weeks of the season for michigan at penn state at maryland and then hosting ohio state we really won't know what michigan is until that second week of november and if they falter in the first game there's really no stopping them from faltering down the stretch if they win the first game they might really have that momentum you know, as far as the Buckeyes go, I thought during big 10 media days that ryan day was just giving a little coach speak when he was talking about this quarterback situation that it was open between Kyle McCord and Devin Brown. But I, I hear Devin Brown's done really a nice job. Um, maybe that it really is an open competition. Maybe during the Indiana game, Kyle McCord plays three quarters and Devin comes in for the fourth. I think uh, Devin's only taken like 15 snaps. So there is a big gap there. Marvin Harrison Jr., of course, is going to have an incredible year 
at wide receiver. And here's a fun fact for you that just I shake my head at, but I mean, Isaiah, you saw Jim Harbaugh go through this. You know, he was winning a lot of games, but he was losing to Ohio State and also to Michigan State in the early going, and people were kind of getting a little upset with him. Uh, Ryan Day could go undefeated into the Michigan game at the end of November, and he very well could be undefeated at that. Both teams could be. And that will put him at 90% as far as winning 90% of his games in five years. And yet if he loses that Michigan game, uh, the hot seat is up. I mean, you could speak to that. You just saw the patience that Michigan exuded with Jim Harbaugh until he finally got over the hump. Well, it's a little bit different in Columbus, of course. It's not quite the same as as anywhere else. The, the, there really is one game that you have to win in Columbus, and it is that Michigan game. Michigan has really three rivals, even though they don't play Notre Dame yearly anymore. Uh, so while the, the premium is on that Ohio State game, I mean, we, you, you kind of could see even just some some tension building in 2021 when Michigan lost to Michigan State. In a, in a top 10 matchup with college game day there, Fox Big Noon kickoff, Michigan goes and loses. And then a couple weeks later, no one in Ann Arbor remembers whatsoever because Michigan beats Ohio State. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, it, it, it's a little bit of a different scenario when you've got one school that kind of encompasses an entire state's fan base. Michigan doesn't have that. So people feel uneasy, uh, but certainly a lot of Michigan fans in particular recognize the cyclical nature of this rivalry throughout the uh, John Cooper years. Michigan won... Uh, won 10 of 13, and then it was when Jim Tressel came, everything kind of changed, and I think that people understand that it will go back and forth from time to time. Um, and certainly now you've got a situation where a lot of Buckeyes, whether it's the coaches, the players, that don't know as much what it's like to beat Michigan, and it, you kind of see that uh, see that same dynamic playing out that Michigan had where Michigan would, uh, would have the lead late and then Ohio State would just come and take it back. And uh, I said last year in the middle of the, the game when I was standing on the field in Columbus, I said, if Ohio State loses this game, they're going to lose the next one because now it's not about talent at all. It's about a mental impediment. And mm -hmm. certainly you hear them about their reaction. How are they reacting uh, in the offseason, what are they doing to change and all of these types of things, whereas Michigan's just kind of continuing its trajectory. So it's one of those things where uh, as time goes by, the, the longer it takes for them to actually go out and beat Michigan, the, the more they're going to be in their own heads, and it becomes a little bit more of a mental game than just a physical one. Zach, everybody talks Ohio State and Michigan, and yet I've spent a lot of time this summer talking about your team and the Penn State and Italy Lions. This is – this is probably James Franklin's best football team he's had. He just talked the other day uh, how deep this team is, and they feel that they're gonna they're gonna take a stab at this championship. They lost two games last year. They were to Michigan and Ohio State. If they can split them or win them, it could be a different story this year. What do you think? Splitting them's definitely in the, in the realm of possibility here is winning them both. I mean, you got to go on the road to Columbus and then you host a very, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on Michigan. I'm bearish on Ohio state. I think that Penn state is actually, they are built to go toe to toe with that Ohio state team. If it weren't, wasn't for a, a great play by that Ohio state defensive end to pick off a bat in the air and pick off a Sean Clifford screen pass. Like he was supposed to be chopped down that game becomes a little different because that's a game winning drive that was taken away. But Michigan seems to in, in Illinois for that fact is that Penn state has to be able to overcome that, that barrier, that mountain of bigger physical run first, heavy teams. They just, Penn state is a finesse team. They're a very skilled team. They, they like to stretch the field. They're going to go deep over the top, but now they're starting to mimic that Michigan game plan. They're taking elements of what has worked against them and now they're making it for them. So Penn state, Ohio state and, and Michigan all have top 10 offensive lines in the nation. In my opinion, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that either. Um, you have two great, incredible running backs, the formula that's worked for Michigan, right? A mm -hmm. really deep offensive line, a talented one to go along with tremendous ball carriers who are both going to get drafted in day one or day two when the NFL draft does roll around for them. And, and now you have a quarterback that can take it's It's the quarterback this time. Trace yeah. McSorley had that it factor. Sean Clifford for what, I mean, he was good and he was the better quarterback last year. I'm not saying start Drew as a true freshman, let him sit season and learn and now it's his time to shine. Is he going to live up to the potential that other five stars, Christian Hackenberg, great person, good player, not good enough given all the circumstances, and then we 
forget about Anthony Morelli. Drew Aller is supposed to change all of this yeah. in the modern recruiting era. All right, I'll put you on the spot here, Zach. Who's winning the Big Ten? Is Penn State doing it or somebody else? I'd like to think they do. It's ultimately going to come down to a tiebreaker, which is how it happened in 2016, which is exactly what I see happening again. As I sit here right now, I, I will say that Penn State beats Ohio State. I think they're vulnerable enough that Penn State is able to take that step. It's personal for them. It's just a matter of closing out that game because Penn State was able to beat them in 2016. They should have beat them in 2017, 2018. And now you're kind of back to that same level, even though it's out in Columbus. I don't care what the early spreads say that Penn State is an 11-point underdog or whatever the spread has jumped to. Uh, I am more... I don't want to say fearful, but I respect Michigan a little more this season just because they retain a lot of what made them so successful last year. Even though that game's in Beaver Stadium, I, I think that Penn State beats Ohio State. Michigan is truly a toss-up for me, um, and I would lean Wolverines at this point. But like Isaiah said, to, to start off this, that is why the games are played on the field and not on paper. Isaiah, final call, pushing the button. Is Michigan winning it? At the moment, I have Michigan winning it. Again, obviously, contingent injuries and uh, coaching bluster. I, I think as long as Michigan stays healthy and sticks to the script. Uh, I mean, we've, we've seen what Michigan's done uh, against both Penn State and Ohio State uh, in, in recent years. I do think that Penn State game is going to be closer than, uh, than a lot of people might think. That's my kind of trouble game of the year, more so than Ohio State, especially because it is in Happy Valley. But Michigan's been able to win in Happy Valley. Uh, so I, I am curious about that one. Maryland does pose an issue as well, especially with Josh Gaddis being there. But uh, while other teams are trying to play catch up, Michigan's got a lot of the same personnel, pretty much the same coaching staff, and is just building on what they've already done. So, yeah, I do have Michigan currently being that Big Ten favorite. I'll conclude. I'll agree with you. I think it comes down to the fourth quarter of that game in November, and Michigan comes out on top. Well, could someone make a dark horse run and make a grab for the top of the Big Ten this season? We'll tackle that next on the Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked On Big Ten. These days, every new hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. It's a big deal and it can make you nervous, but we can simplify that for you. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. It takes all the pressure off trying to fill that gap in your office of your small business. What you do is you post your job, you add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile and spread the word that you're hiring. Let everybody know. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you like to interview, and eventually hire. That is the whole purpose. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, as you can see on Ultimate College Football Preview on Lockdown Big Ten, we've done a little musical chairs here. We have some new guests, as you can see on screen. Ryan Herrings from Lockdown Badgers. Feel free to check him out as well. Trey Moore from Lockdown Terps, brand new to his uh, his program, his podcast. Jacob Rude from Lockdown Hoosiers is with us. Also talking with Trent Condon uh, from Lockdown Hawkeyes and Matt Sheehan from Lockdown Spartans. Let's get to it here. I want to ask you guys about your upcoming seasons. I'm going to start with you, Ryan, and Wisconsin. I see a lot of polls, and you know, they're the Michigans and the Ohio States. I see Wisconsin up high a lot, fourth or maybe fifth in the Big Ten. Uh, let's talk about what uh, is a successful season for you and what you guys expect up there. Luke Fickle bringing in a lot of transfers. I don't know if things are going to gel real quickly, and he come, you know, uh, gets uh, gets the Badgers up to fourth place or fourth best record in the Big. I don't know. What are your expectations? Uh, un unreasonable uh, is probably the best way to to put this. <laughs> yeah, like we are very much in optimism, heavy optimism season with uh, Luke Fickle coming in. Uh, you know, we recently did a podcast. Uh, the Badgers are plus nineteen hundred to go undefeated this year, and we actually talked about that. So that yeah. that's where our level of optimism is now. Realistically. 
Luke Fickle is about the best hire you can make this offseason. And he's coming into a program that already has a pretty solid foundation. They went and found one of the better offensive coordinators in the country with Phil Longo coming in. So this is not the offense and the, the Badgers of the last 20 years. So just from an excitement standpoint, uh, Badger fans haven't been this excited for a season without hyperbole in probably 20 years. Um, wow. Will it will it gel right away? I, I tend to think there will be some hiccups. Um, there's a lot of changes on both sides of the ball, but the excitement is incredible and the schedule is pretty favorable. So I think nine to 10 wins is very likely and realistic this year for the Badgers. Trey Moore, uh, let's talk about Maryland and Mike Loxley. He says, look, I've been here. These are my guys. It's time for us to compete for the Big Ten. And actually, when I previewed your team earlier this year, I, I actually saw a path to nine or ten wins as well. Talia, quarterback, some receivers uh, that transferred in. What are your thoughts? What are your expectations? What is a successful season for Maryland this year? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, a successful season looks like about nine wins um, I do think it's a possibility that we can get to 10. I don't expect us to beat Michigan, Penn State, or Ohio State. I don't think we're there yet, but I do think there's a chance that we upset them. If you look back at last year, we came into one possession of both Michigan and Ohio State. So I do think we can get there. And If you look back at the Michigan game in particular, we did fumble the first kick of the game and it ended up being on the four yard line and they scored right away and that game ended up being a seven point game so we're right there as a program i expect us to get eight or nine wins and i love the um where coach locks is going with the program but eight or nine wins is where i would say we're at about right now yeah i, I think that's very very reasonable jacob i told you before we started taping i am an indiana university grad um, 26 transfer portal kids in this year. It's a completely different team. What are your expectations for Tom Allen? Not eight or nine wins like the uh, like <laughs> the previous two. It's going to be a little bit different when it comes to Indiana this year. Uh, I mean, Tom Allen is firmly kind of on a hot seat. I, I don't think that he's going to be uh, fired or anything after this season, but really only because his buyout is so big. But it's wild we're kind of to this point after where we were during the COVID season and how quickly things have kind of unraveled and you're back to almost square one with this program. So uh, I, when I talked about the team last year, I just kind of wanted to see improvement and there was improvement from the previous year. It was still only four wins and a pretty fluky fourth win at that. So I, I want to kind of see improvement again, but, uh, I mean, five wins, maybe some more com uh, being more competitive in each game. I mean, if you get to a bowl game, I, I think that is absolutely huge. But in the Big Ten East, thank God that is going to be gone. Getting to a bowl game is really tough. So I'm very glad that this will be the last season of that. Well, you think. I think they're going to bring the divisions back once they add all these other schools. Matt, I saw you shaking your head there uh, when uh, Jacob was talking. <sighs> That's it's why I have not slept right ever since uh, <laughs> November. So no, it's cool. I'm totally over it. It's fine. It's it's water under the bridge or whatever the old adage is. God, <laughs> seventeen point lead at home, unbelievable. Yeah, it was a brutal little snow snowy day. <laughs> um, Mel Tucker talked about on media day how he is really invested in the front seven and defense. Uh, how do you uh, see this season coming out? Is it going to be a big improvement for him this year? It's going to have to be, look, and there's no hot seat. I know that that's like a popular thing to throw around in the nation. Oh, Mel Tucker on the hot seat. Not with a $75 million buyout, unless someone hits the Mega Millions tonight and that's where they want to put their money. But no, it's going to be a big season for Mel Tucker coming up. And look, this is what happens every early August. Uh, we don't have our quarterback from last year. We lost our two NFL caliber receivers. We had 27 different starters on defense last year because of injuries, uh, so we had that luck going for us. But still, with all that said, like I'm a little optimistic for this year. Uh, it's going to be done in the trenches, and it has to be. Look, Michigan State under Mel Tucker hasn't really had an identity in his three years here, except for the one year it was just, well, give the ball to Kenneth Walker, the guy that should have won the NFL Rookie yeah. of the Year award. It's not really an identity, but this year I think the identity has to be in the trenches. And just like you said, he beefed up on the defensive line through the transfer portal. Hopefully these guys can go without stepping on every single stick of dynamite and every rake in the practice facility and actually get <laughs> through a season healthy on defense. That'd be really awesome too. But God, for the first time in a long time, 
talent and depth on the offensive line. And got the last time that's happened, I, 2015, <laughs> the college football playoff year. So that's where we're going to have to make our hay in the trenches. And I think Mel Tucker on paper has the talent to do so too. I'm not going to go crazy here. I'm not going to say orange bowl. No, just like a nice little Jacksonville tax layer bowl, you know, which is success. You know, we're, we're trying to get out of five and seven here. So. Well, real quick, how about Noah Kim? I think this kid was not highly recruited because he broke his leg in yeah. high school, and I, I think he's got some talent. Maybe some other schools miss. I'm expecting a good season out of him. What do you think? Yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds because, right, I mean, we took him from Virginia Tech, and I think his other offer was William & Mary, that old powerhouse down there. But, I mean, it's going to be interesting because there's also Caden Hauser, the true sophomore, and he was a four-star kid, uh, you know, one of the elite 11 kids out there, did really well in that competition, has great arm talent. So you have the young gun, gunslinger, who was really highly rated, that was brought on by the staff or the holdover from the Mark D'Antonio days. Right now, I mean, Noah Kim, I mean, he has more experience in games. It's not a lot, but he does have more. And he's been impressing people at practice. So I think it is a dead even race to who's going to get that number one spot. Something that could go on to the week three for the Washington game, honestly, is how I see it unfolding. Trent, let's uh, let's talk about the Hawkeyes for a minute here. Uh, we all know that the offense has been somewhat disastrous, uh, but the defense was pretty mm-hmm. good. They lost a lot of talent to the NFL on defense, but I, I think it's still a good defense coming back. And when you bring in uh, Cade McNamara, look, I don't think Cade has to set the world on fire, but he is a guy that has won a Big Ten title and gone to a college football playoff mm-hmm. game. I'm thinking if the offense can just rise to mediocrity and have the defense play well, I think Iowa could have a big season. What do you think? I'm right there with you, and I got to throw this caveat out here first because I'm not Hawkeye Homer. I am somebody that is usually very pessimistic when it comes to the teams that I root for and the teams that I cheer for. This is as optimistic as I've been for an Iowa football team since 2009. You remember that year? They went to the Orange Bowl, and they had a chance for a Big Ten championship, lost in overtime at Ohio State. The optimism is through the roof. It starts with Cade McNamara, a competent quarterback, something that they haven't had in three years. Offensive coordinator has hasn't changed, but you know what? Kate McNamara saved Jim Harbaugh's job, and he very well could save Brian Ferentz's job this upcoming season. You couple that with an improved wide receiver group. You go out there, you bring in Caleb Brown from Ohio State. You go out and get a very good wide receiver from the FCF ranks in, in Seth Anderson. The tight ends are going to be great. The running back's going to be better. And if the offensive line can just be adequate, the pieces are there for them to be average. And we've seen with Iowa. Iowa has the eighth most wins in college football over the last four seasons, over the last seven seasons. They are in the top 10 in terms of victory, yet only two division titles. In the final year for the Big Ten West, I'm sorry, it should not be Wisconsin with that new coaching staff. Iowa should be the favorite to win the West. It's very interesting. Let's talk some Husker football here. Derek Pearson is with us. Derek, a lot of excitement there with you guys. Matt Rule, new coach. I think everybody's ready to run through a wall with this guy. I don't know about Jeff Sims, the quarterback, the transfer out of Georgia Tech. Hasn't really put up a lot of big numbers there. But what do you think about him? And what do you think, uh, how quickly can Matt Rule get this Husker program going in the right direction? Well, Matt Rule has done everything that Nebraska fans want, which is win the offseason. He's said all the right things, been in all the right places, uh, made all the right moves. He's been who he said he was. Um, You mentioned Jeff Sims, and quite frankly, of all the questions about Nebraska football, Jeff Sims is the one the one player on this roster that I have the fewest questions about. Uh, A leader, done the offseason work, uh, poised. Uh, He's got that that old school moxie that we like to talk about when you see it in quality leaders. He's leading the team. He's done that in a short period of time. So in the long list of questions about Nebraska football, Jeff Sims isn't really one of them. All right, guys, I want to kind of go around table here a little bit uh, on this show earlier. You know, we talked with uh, Ohio or with Michigan and with Penn State. The consensus is, look, Michigan and Ohio State, That this conference comes down to the last game of the season. Unless Penn State can get in there, split them or beat them. They're really good this year, but let's talk about the best of the rest. If I can't, if you can't have those three schools, who are you guys going to pick to win the conference? And you know, we just made some cases for Maryland and and the Hawkeyes and a couple other schools having some really good seasons this year. Can they get go the distance, get in that Big Ten championship game? Uh, let's start it off, uh, Ryan, with you and the Badgers. Who do you think could be a dark horse in the Big Ten this year? 
I, I think the Badgers can certainly challenge that. But if we're talking dark horse, I think Illinois is an interesting team getting Altmeyer in. Um, schedules matter so much in the Big Ten, especially when you're talking East and West. And you look at Illinois' schedule, they don't play Ohio State. They don't play Michigan. They play Penn State at home. They get Wisconsin at home. Their hardest road game is probably Iowa on the road. And that, listen, Kinnick's a beast, but that's a great schedule for a defensive line that is really good. Altmeyer, if he hits on all cylinders, Illinois is going to surprise people if Altmeyer can be the quarterback they hope he can be. All right, Trey Moore with the Terps. If it's not the Terps, who could be a dark horse? I think Nebraska with Coach Rule coming in and Sims, a really good dual threat quarterback from um, Georgia Tech. I think Sims is really underrated, but I think it is Nebraska in the Big Ten. All right, Matt uh, from Locked On Spartans, who's the dark horse for you this year? Yeah, really wish I could call Penn State the dark horse, even though they're over-under 10 wins, but eh, that's cheating. So Trent, where's my guy Trent? There we go, baby. Hawkeyes, yeah. let's go. Hawkeye Nation, let's Woo. ride, baby. Uh, just for everything you said, look, that defense is incredible almost every single year down there. Can the offense just be, eh, because I think that's all that it takes to even get to Indy. And certainly, like, the Big Ten West can't lose every single one of these games, right? I mean, they, just, uh, just on math alone, they got to win one of these times, right? So, yeah, wh- why not? Let's go. Fire up the Ferentz train. Woo! <laughs> it sounded weird, but yeah, we're, we're going for it. We're going for all it. Right. All right. All right, Trent, let's take the Hawkeyes out. Who's your dark horse? Mm-hmm. I'm right there alongside the Illinois train. It's A lot of it's Bielema. He's proven it in the past. Obviously, his days at Wisconsin. You look at the way that this team is built. They're just turning themselves into a mini Badger program. The big, fat offensive lineman, the running game. And quarterback position we saw from a year ago doesn't really matter in his system. Go back the last two decades at Wisconsin. Hasn't been great quarterback play. It's been good quarterback play. So now you couple that with what Illinois is going. It's them. You mentioned the schedule. I'm right there. I'm. If you're moving past the top two in the West, you're moving past the top three in the East, I think Illinois is the best shot. All right, Jacob, I'm going to presume you're not going to say Hudson Card, the new quarterback at Purdue, although they were, <laughs> they were in the Big Ten championship game last year. Who's your dark horse? <laughs> No, shockingly, I'm not going with Purdue. I want to ride this uh, this Illinois train and that I think if you're talking dark horse, it pretty much has to come out of the Big Ten West. And there's a couple schools that can win it. It's as open as it ever feels. But uh, Illinois was, kind of came out of nowhere last year and and nearly won the Big Ten West. Um, I'm a Bielema believer, and uh, I, I think that he can get it done at Illinois. And if you're looking at dark horses, I, I think Illinois is a fine one. All right, Derek, close us out. Who's the last dark horse in this race? You know, I'm I'm gonna go Sparty. Uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna lean up heavily. I I'm a little biased. Um, I actually coached I actually coached Noah Kim, and let me tell you, the, for the folks that I coached him in high school all the way through, I met him when he was ten years old, uh, before I moved to Nebraska, and he is wow. an elite athlete, high level. I think Michigan State fans are about to be surprised at the jewel that they have. Uh, right behind center for them. The kid's electric. He lost one game in high school. The only game he lost was a game they, where he broke his leg in a state tournament. So th- he's elite level kid, loves the game, high level football IQ, and competes like a fire. So I, I think he and Mel Tucker side by side, that's a dangerous pair of the Big Ten. Well, for everybody that checks out Lockdown Big Ten, I want you uh, to invite you to check out my colleagues here. Uh, Lockdown Badgers with Ryan Herrings. Lockdown Terps with Trey Moore. Lockdown Hoosiers with Jacob Rude. And Lockdown Hawkeyes with Trent Condon. And Lockdown Spartans with Matt Sheehan. It is going to be an exciting season in the Big Ten here in 2023. Will the Big Ten get more than one team in the college football playoff? Find out on Ultimate College Football Preview on Locked On Big Ten. But first, I want to tell you about bird dogs. I just got some new bird dogs in the mail the other day. They are fantastic. They're the most comfortable clothes I have. Bird dogs make you look good. Bird dogs stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and the leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird dog shorts do the same exact thing as Lululemon, but fit way better. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restricted cotton that is really uncomfortable in the middle of the summertime. Bird dogs fix this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird dogs uses anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. Go to birddogs.com slash lockdown college and enter the promo code lockdown college for a free white tech hat with your order. That's birddogs.com 
slash locked on college or promo code locked on college for a free white tech hat. You won't want to take your bird dogs off that. We promise you. All right, as we continue on our ultimate college football preview on Locked On Big Ten, I want to take a look to the end of the season, the college football playoff. We still have four teams before we expand to 12. And, you know, a lot of times it's like, is the SEC going to get two teams in? Is the Big Ten going to get two? Is that it? I want to talk to you guys about it. And, uh, Zach, we'll start with you. Uh, No matter what happens coming at the end of the season, whoever's the Big Ten champion, does the Big Ten get two teams in the college football playoff? Yeah, definitely. I, I don't think that's <laughs> that's hard to argue against, for or against. I, I really think that's an easy answer, whether it's Penn State, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan, Ohio State. I, I'd really like to I, – I know how good the SEC is, too. Like, these are the two premier conferences. But I really could see a scenario where, what, all three teams are 11-1? and one? And then I, I think what's going to – it's hard to look at the playoff committee and say like, okay, if, if each individual losses to a top five team for any of these schools, hypothetically, I mean, this is easy. If one of them gets two losses, that that's really it. And then whoever makes the big 10 championship, uh, that that's an easy one as well, but uh, they're all in the big 10 East, which, which stinks, you know, I'd yeah. like it to be where it was the, the top two teams from the conference, the big 10 West, has had nothing to offer in the past decade. And that's why you've seen Ohio State, Michigan State, Penn State, Michigan, like any of those teams a- advance on mm-hmm. uh, Michigan State a little on the, uh, you know, in the smaller end of the spectrum. We don't here, need but... to concern ourselves with Michigan State. <laughs> but, but they, you know, they represented it, right? And I, I just think that those, it, it's a good thing they're going to 12. I, I People were like, well, just set, put it at six or eight. No, no, I think it should be 24. Why can Division Two do it, Division Three do it, but we had an error where journalists voted on who the national champion was, a computer decided the top two teams, and then we get to four. I feel like as college football fans, we've been robbed of something that's so good, and finally it, has, it is here, and our patience is being rewarded. Well, when we do expand to 12 and 16, and as you say, maybe 24 someday, Isaiah, how do you feel about the prospect of Michigan and Ohio State playing in November, turning around and playing the first week of December, and then playing a third time, maybe by the end of December or early January, and playing three times? All of a sudden, now it's a football series. I hate it, Craig. Thank you. Um, (laughs) uh, It's... I don't I, – while it is kind of exciting, that that prospect, and we've certainly seen uh, some rematches more so in the SEC, certainly Georgia-Alabama and LSU and Alabama and other teams in Alabama, it always seems. Uh, I, I'm not a big fan of, of in-season rematches, uh, even if it is in the postseason personally. And I, I'm also a, a, a proponent of the idea of if smaller and more exclusive is better. Uh, that that's just me. Uh, and I know, you know, obviously, uh, Seiko, you, you, you just had the 24, uh, Jim Harbaugh wants to see it more like 16 to 24. I, I honestly like it at four, maybe six. I mean, heck I'd go back to two if I had my own way. Uh, but, uh, that's just because I, I understand it, it takes a lot of, uh, uh, subjectivity to kind of get to that point where you're choosing the, the national champions. It doesn't always work. Uh, we, I remember that in 2006, everyone thought, uh, you know, Ohio State and Michigan were the two best teams, and both of them get in the postseason and get shellacked. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I, I like the more exclusive uh, type of thing, and I like trying to keep college football as streamlined and in its lane that it's been in. That the things that have made this this sport so great, uh, but and, and to the whole idea of having multiple big 10 teams in the playoff. I think it's going to be, I think it's, it's certainly a possibility, but it depends on the field just as much as it depends on the big 10, right? Cause yeah. if you have an undefeated Georgia team uh, or a one loss Georgia team an undefeated or one loss Alabama team uh, undefeated or one loss LSU team, one undefeated or on, uh, one loss USC or uh, Clemson. I mean, that muddies the waters a little bit because, yeah, you can sit there and look at the Big Ten and say, well, they've got three of the best teams, but then it's going to become a little bit harder to pick. But the only thing is we we haven't had those real conundrums when we've gotten to December because no matter what, we the best four teams have been obvious by the time that we get there every single year. Even last year, all USC had to do was win its rematch against Utah 
couldn't do it. And therefore Ohio state's in and you know, you watch that Ohio state Georgia team uh, game and you can't say that Ohio state wasn't one of the best four teams. So uh, I feel gross saying that, but nonetheless, it, that's, we always have these conundrums in the off season all the way up until November and these things end up getting sorted out. So I really don't have a problem with the, the best of four format because there's never been a point where we've really had to doubt it to this point. I don't know that it was actually broken. Yeah, we are kindred spirits. I, I get hammered on a, a radio show all the time because I say, just keep it at four. I, I always made the argument when we had the BCS and there were two teams. Sometimes we'd have an argument about the third team and it, did they get, you know, where they shortchanged a little bit. But the, my point back then was the fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth team, they weren't good enough to win a national championship. I said, we barely have enough to field four good teams. I agree with that. There's a, usually a drop off after four, five, six. Uh, we have all these blowouts in the semifinals, which proves my point. Nobody wants to listen to me, but I agree with you a little bit. Let me backtrack a little bit, and Isaiah, get your opinion on something Zach said. How do you see uh, how many teams are getting into the playoffs um, from the Big Ten? If we have if we have three teams, eleven and one, I like that eleven and one scenario. That's that's some chaos. Uh, I think it would end up uh, like I said earlier. It kind of depends on the rest of the field, right? If it, it if you have. Uh, two SEC teams that are in the same position, then certainly you can see two SEC and two Big Ten. But what it, what happens if USC runs the table? If they figure out defense out in Los Angeles, especially with Caleb Williams and some of the, the weapons they have on offense, I mean, they, they certainly could get there. Uh, you look at uh, Clemson now that they're starting Cade Klubnick. I mean, that's, that's a team that hasn't really gone anywhere. It's just kind of went from being a, a 12 and 0, 11 and 1 type team to a 10 and 2 type team. Uh, Notre Dame is obviously if a, a wild card. What if one of Ohio State's losses is to, to Notre Dame and Michigan or Penn State's only losses to Ohio State and it's a close one? Uh, certainly, it, then you've got some decisions to make because you've got uh, one team that, uh, that maybe shouldn't, you know, depends on, you know, how you look at Notre Dame. What does Notre Dame do compared to Ohio State's resume and, and all of that? And, uh, and now you're trying to juggle all of these things. So I think it really just depends on the field as much as anything. I don't think obviously three teams are going to get in barring complete implosion of the rest of the field. Uh, and then you're really trying to settle the big 10 on a national stage. I don't know that anyone really wants that, uh, but uh, it, it's possible to get two in. Uh, but I mean, last year was the first time that it's happened. Certainly it, there are teams good enough and poised enough to be able to do it. I think it also depends on what those losses look like, right? If, yeah. If it's if it's a the Michigan Ohio State game goes exactly the way it did last year, and there's at least one more good team out there, I, I don't know that you put a, a Ohio State or Michigan team in that has lost by twenty something points, especially on their home field, uh, into the playoffs. So it really just depends mightily on what the rest of college football looks like. Zach, I gotta ask you, what's it like to attend a whiteout? I've had it from multiple different perspectives too. Um, being in the press box as a member of the media and then being there as a fan in the student section. And that was the 2016 game where Penn State beat Ohio State, the the blocked field goal. I can go back to that one and I will never forget that moment. It it was almost silent at that point because of how loud it was. If you can imagine that, just how silent, uh, it, just everything, just the noise kind of blocked out when you realize wow, they blocked this field goal. Grant Haley, somebody, if you can even recognize him, I think that's 15 over there running it back for a touchdown. So that's the whiteout atmosphere that this can bring, that it can change games. And I, I, people have said this, that Penn State gets a seven-point advantage when there's, when there's a whiteout game. Yeah. I think that, that that's very fair. That's easy to say, uh, and, and it's paid off. The, the whiteout is, I think Beaver Stadium in general is just a difficult environment to play on. The whiteout adds an extra flair, of course, I, for players, when you talk to them, when you talk to them, they say it is difficult to kind of the way the color contrasts with the football field and just everything else. And then the bright stadium lights, they say that it, it's di like you have to adjust your vision, almost mm -hmm. develop some night vision <laughs> in that it, it truly it the, the stadium lights, the night game bring out the white jerseys, the white shirts and everything else uh, in that atmosphere. So, yes, it's it's as best as home field advantage can come. And it's a shame that it's not the Michigan game, but that's, that has to do a lot with the TV networks and the timing. I was going to get blown out. <laughs> yeah. 
And Isaiah, of course, the atmosphere at the big house is no slouch either. Um, final question for you. What's the season going to be like starting it out with Jim Harbaugh on suspension for uh, buying a couple cheeseburgers? Well, before we get to that, I got to say, the, I, I will second the whiteout stuff. I've been to technically three whiteouts, one that was a whiteout with a stripe uh, and I, the night game whiteouts, because weirdly one of the whiteouts I went to was an afternoon game. I mean, it. Mm -hmm. The night game ones, you can't hear yourself think. I'm on the, I've been on the sidelines for those four. It's insane. Um, as far as the Jim Harbaugh suspension, I mean, that's not confirmed. So we're just still kind of waiting on that. I, I, after talking to some reporters at uh, Big Ten Media Days, we, we, we were wondering uh, the veracity of it. And considering it was coming from a, a national writer in Ross Dellinger, uh, that kind of shows you that that was the N NCAA kind of slipping it out and seeing uh, – seeing kind of what the reaction was, especially from Michigan. But that, that investigation is still ongoing, uh, so we'll see if that ends up coming to fruition. Michigan has been fighting this thing uh, tooth and nail uh, it, it, just because Jim Harbaugh says that he doesn't recall uh, the fact that he uh, supposedly had bought a cheeseburger for a commitment. Um, I mean, I don't recall what happened earlier today, so I can't, you know, I was hitting the head a lot less than Jim Harbaugh has been throughout the years, so I can believe him when he says he really doesn't recall Hard to prove that as a lie. Uh, but if he isn't out there, I mean, you're looking at East Carolina, and that could could have been a problem, but they've only returned 33% of their roster. Uh, you're looking at uh, UNLV. You're looking at uh, Bowling Green. And then the, the Big Ten schedule starts with the National Powerhouse and Rutgers. Uh, and all four are at home. So really, I mean – they could, you know, have one of us coach the team, and we that Michigan would probably be okay. So uh, I think we'd probably be able to go out there and manage that with the roster Michigan has. So I, I, I don't think it's going to be that much of a difference if he is suspended for those first four games. Um, maybe it'll, they'll be a little off kilter, but it, it, I look at it kind of somewhat in a similar vein to to twenty seventeen when uh, uh, I believe it was twenty or it was twenty eighteen rather. Uh, when uh, Ohio State had suspended Urban Meyer for three games for mm. something that was a bit more serious, and uh, and Ryan Day got his first uh, taste of head coaching. They had a tougher game on the schedule in TCU, but they still managed to go out there and wipe the floor with their opponents. So I, I think the same would be for Michigan. Well, I certainly wish you guys the best of luck this year. I do think it is going to be a three-team race uh, and a fight, Penn State, uh, Michigan, and Ohio State. A quick note, uh, check out Isaiah on Lockdown Wolverines. Jay, who's not here, check him out on Lockdown Buckeyes. And, of course, Zach on Lockdown Nittany Lions. It's going to be a fantastic season this year in the Big Ten. What other teams are going to make the college football playoff this season? The Ultimate College Football Preview continues with a look at the top teams from each conference. Follow Lockdown Big Ten to catch that conversation. Or check out another conference preview by subscribing to all the Lockdown Conference shows wherever you get your podcasts. Now that you know who the players are for the Big Ten, join me, Caroline Fenton, as we break down who makes the college football playoff and who will ultimately win it all. Go to Locked on Big Ten wherever you get your podcasts for this bonus episode of the Ultimate College Football Preview.